So let's uh, pray. Father, thank you uh, for letting us enjoy your word and study your word. Thank you for the beauty of it. Um, thank you that you've given us inquisitive minds. I pray that as we look at different questions uh, that you'll help us. I pray the end result is we'll think more of your word, more of you, and be drawn uh, to uh, the grandeur of life in your kingdom under your rule. And I pray that you would use this class as a means of grace to that end. For we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So, if somebody wants to do a question, and we, we have one um, right here, so I can just push this and it'll make a slide of it. Or, did I push the wrong one? <coughs> So the question is this, why does it seem like God no longer kills man when he sets himself up against God, such as Korah, uh, Pharaoh, Abiram, uh, Numbers uh, 16, or in the New Testament with Ananias and Sapphira lie about the amount of money they got for the field and God strikes them dead? That is a great question. So... What do you think the answer to that question is? Because clearly, um, God is serious enough about sin, kicks Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden after one sin, one sin, um, just breaking God's law once, brings about the fallen nature and all the actual sins. Um, Nadab and a Bihu uh, maybe get drunk we're not sure about that, uh, but offer strange fire and God kills both of them dead. Tells uh, Aaron not to uh, even mourn and to not stop the service over them. Uh, uh, the two who lie about um, uh, the money, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, killed. Um, what about it? Is it like that God, uh, God having a bad day, or uh, why, why doesn't that happen? Well, um, the Bible really doesn't say, uh, uh, so anything we offer is speculation, but I wonder if it isn't to help us see how um, seriously he is about sin, and the day will come when he treats all sin in uh, absolute uh, public and final uh, fashion. But um, if he did that every time, I'm not sure I would be alive. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've rebelled uh, against God's rule and sinned against his law and thought, word and deed. And he has every right to act that way, and he will act that way, but uh, he's chosen grace, and he wants us to be people of grace. Uh, what, what does the Lord require of you but to seek justice and to love, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And if we're a people who uh, are merciful, uh, even, even when we're in the right, uh, I wonder if we aren't learning something about God, but he certainly could do that. Um, he certainly could expose all of us to punishment, uh, and uh, in his nature, he uh, shows grace, and he hasn't done that. But that's a great, great question. And feel free on any of these to ask follow-up questions if you want. Anyone else have a question? Any question you can ask any part of the Bible? Yes. Um, so between the time of God creating Adam and Eve and like the end of creation time, uh, how long was it before they sinned and fell? Like how long did they have in the 
we don't we don't know um, and the estimates uh, there are two uh, given estimates is how long it could be the shortest one there was on the day they were created um, so um, created on the sixth day and sometime before the end of that day they sinned. A lot of Jewish people believe that. If that were true, there is an elegance to the story in that Jesus would have died uh, on the day that they fell. Either way, he died on the day they were created, so on the Friday. Um, other Jews think that the tenth day of the month so that they were created on the first day of the month and then on the tenth day and you do have Yom Kippur and the lamb being taken in on that day and if that's true then there's an elegance in the story that way um, the first date we know it was before the date when it says uh, Seth was born at 130 years so he's born to replace um, Abel who died so the fall happened before the 130th year the text does say that um, when God judges Eve he says I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth uh, and it says I will greatly increase your bearing which some people would take um, would refer to children born before the fall I'm not sure about that. I mean, the, it, it does say in Hebrew, I will greatly increase, and you could take that and imply that she had had children before um, they fell, but I, I don't know. But some Jewish people uh, take that view as well. It has to be before 130 years, though. So um, on the same day, day 10, somewhere between year uh, zero and one third, <laughs> but th those are the answers that are usually given. Anything else? Any question you want to ask? You can ask it uh, uh, here with this, or you can ask it, uh, just sign into your Google account and type in the um, Google uh, slides and it should come up. Here's another question. Why did God give the Israelites many laws and require perfect obedience when he knew that they could not keep all of his laws? That is a great question. Um, and it, it toys with the question, um, why does God create the Garden of Eden with a test and you keep this um, one law and if you keep this one law you get to stay in and if you don't you get kicked out with the mosaic law you keep these many laws if you follow them you get to stay in if you don't you get kicked out why wouldn't God do it where he's not requiring perfect obedience well uh, the Bible really doesn't say so we're left kind of on our own to wonder and I wonder if, um, well, uh, these are some of the thoughts I've had. Um, if God created our human brains, is it likely or unlikely that God knows every thought that we ever will have, have or will have? And if the answer to that question is yes, it means that anything that we think of, God has already thought of. And if that's the case, then any better way um, that we could possibly imagine God already knows what that better way would be. The question, secondly, is, is God good? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I would give, enter an eternal incarnation to save fallen humanity, but God did. Uh, I'm not sure I would be willing to suffer an eternity of hell but uh, Jesus suffered billions of hells uh, to earn our way back to God. That makes me believe if there were any possible way to do it better or to do it differently that God would have done it. 
So that leaves me with the position that there must be something about doing it this way that in God's mind it accomplishes all the things that he wants to accomplish. And if he wants to thoroughly bless a people uh, in the eschaton, if he knows that blessing is tied on their willing uh, receiving of his uh, kingdom and his rule, maybe what he's doing is persuading and enabling our hearts to want that rule. And uh, so if we ask the question, why didn't God do it this way? Maybe what God would say is, that's what I'm doing. I'm just using this to create a woman who's untemptable by evil. But that's a fantastic question. All of these questions are always good. Great question here. What does the parable of the wineskins mean? Jesus said the kingdom of God is like wineskins. Uh, if you put it in old wineskins, the wine will um, cause the skins to burst. You put new wine in new wineskins. We don't really today know what that means, but it's related to the fact that when you put wine in skins, that um, the fermentation process causes expansion. And if you put it in old uh, skins, then that expansion will cause the win, uh, wine skins to break. And <coughs> what he's saying here, I think, is that some would like to put the gospel in the old wine skins of pharisaical self-righteousness. <coughs> do this, if you do this, as long as it's outward, uh, then you're good to go. And Jesus is saying that just won't work. Uh, you have to, it's an all or nothing thing. And if you break, embrace his rule, his salvation by grace, that that accomplishes something, but it's much different than uh, can be accomplished under a self-righteous um, uh, attempt uh, on your own. These are all good questions. Thank you. So could you speak about the idea of a gap theory? So at one time, a gap theory was very popular. Um, and it goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And those who believe in the gap theory will translate uh, verse 2, and the earth became without form and void. So between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 is the fall of Satan, uh, is a world that perished, and um, the view goes back to the Schofield Study Bible, uh, and it was an attempt to answer, well, what about the dinosaurs? Where, where do you fit, you know, all these um, fossils and everything? And so it became kind of a catch-all. This is how we can get billions and billions of years of time if we just suppose that <coughs> between Genesis 1 and 2, there was a world that perished. Hardly anyone believes that is a right interpretation of that verse today. Um, it's very questionable whether the word haitha can be translated became. Um, it's more likely that when God created it, it was initially without form and void, and then God brought order out of it. Uh, that's probably a spiritual picture of our salvation, that we're without form and void. We're dark. We're under the waters of judgment, we would continue so forever until God says, let there be light. And when God says, let there be light, there is light. God sees the light's good. God develops the chaos into something beautiful. Um, the story of our salvation is very much the same thing. He develops us, takes us. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, and God makes us alive in Christ. So the actual factual historic events of Genesis 
point beyond themselves to a greater spiritual truth, but that only works if there's not a gap theory uh, there. It does leave us the question about time, and that's um, a difficult issue, and I just want to put this in perspective. Um, and if you don't mind, uh, I actually have a, a PowerPoint that might help us here. So to get an idea of this problem of time, um, this was a talk that I did here at the school um, to help us understand some things about the eclipse. Uh, if you imagine that the Earth is the size of this uh, baseball, about a three inch ball, uh, and imagine that that baseball is on the steps of Mercer Hall. Can you imagine that in your mind? Uh, so it's, um, it's there, it's on the very front step. Well, the moon would be the size of that chocolate truffle, okay? And it would be seven and a half feet away, about the size of the sidewalk there. So that little baseball uh, front step and the truffle would be about the size of um, the sidewalk, seven and a half feet away. The sun would be about 30 feet, which is the size of my pickup truck and a small trailer. And it would be almost <laughs> to where the courthouse is away. So it's a little over half a mile away. Okay, if that's true, so imagine those distances are true, here's some interesting facts. Pluto, Pluto would be the size of your pinky's fingernail, all right, in Saudi Daisy. Do you know how far Saudi is, like halfway to Chattanooga? So imagine uh, something that big, much smaller than our moon. Our moon is like that big, so that big. 21 and a half miles away. Blows my mind that a guy figured out mathematically that there had to be an object like that affecting the orbits of the other planets and looked for it and found it with a telescope, Flagstaff, Arizona, 1931. That big, Saudi Daisy. That's amazing to me. Okay, if that's true, how far away would the next closest star be? <coughs> next closest star is Alpha, uh, no, is Proxima Centauri. And it would be 156 thousand miles away. That's six tenths of the dis distance to the moon. It's be four feet wide, six tenths of the distance to the moon. That's the nearest star. The farthest we can see in any direction, look this way, that way, front way, back, up, down. And in the real universe, uh, so, in the real universe, it takes four years, 4.3 years, for light to come from Proxima to Earth. All right? When you look at the edge of the universe in any direction, what we can see is 13.7 billion light years. And that's just as far as we can see. There may be much more out there. So the question of time becomes significant. I mean, you know, you add the numbers up and the uh, 
genealogy say it's something like 6,000 plus years. And yet, when we look in the distance, I mean, that's 28 billion years just from what we can see one side to the other, and that's every direction. So what do we do with that? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I believe that the same God who wrote the Bible is the same God who wrote Revelation in physical sciences. So we have what looks like an apparent contradiction. Uh, the Bible is putting the ages of everything very recent. Put that in perspective, if 13.7 billion years is a, a watch, 24 hours in a watch, <coughs> The Bible would be putting creation at four-tenths of a second before midnight, and light, the speed of light, would be putting it 24 hours uh, earlier than that. So what do we do? Well, not sure. Uh, I wonder <coughs> if... God's present doesn't have an effect on time. We know that when he created uh, the original plants and things, he said, let there be light, there was light, let there be plants, apparently they grew, uh, bore fruit. If you had a tree, it would take years for it to grow up and to bear fruit, and yet apparently that's do it, taking place just in the immediate presence of God. If you cut that tree down and you counted the rings, how old would that tree be? Well, you count 35 rings or something like that, it would look like it was 35 years old, but it happened. Uh, it says the text in, <coughs> excuse me, God's presence in a short period of time. We know that when Moses received the law, that he, um, was in God's presence 40 days without sleep, water, or food. Well, if you go without water, you'll die in just a few days, and water and sleep, <coughs> water, sleep, and food. So apparently the presence of God was doing strange thing to the passage of time. With Aaron's rod that budded, that's something apparently time goes backwards and then goes forwards. Um, uh, when Jesus turned the water into wine, that's usually a process that takes uh, years, and yet he did it instantaneously. So I wonder uh, if uh, infinite, eternal, all-powerful God could have an effect on time that makes time seem strange. Uh, so I don't doubt that there you can measure the 13.7 billion years. I wonder if the immensity of that is due to the presence of God uh, uh, affecting the passage of time. But I don't know. I want to believe whatever the Bible says. And I've added the numbers up many times, and I can't find gaps in long periods. So uh, I wonder if the immensity of the universe is perhaps saying something different uh, than the travel of time now. I'm going to go ahead and stop this.